Well, hello, good evening. Welcome to this week's Confident Women Workshop. And I wanna thank you for joining us live on Facebook and for those that are in this room tonight. The topic is be careful how you live. Be careful how you live. And there was so much that came out of this study. I will only be scratching the surface. So I encourage you and challenge you to seek out God's word and have his Holy Spirit awaken in you areas in which you can be more purposeful in your life. The foundation uh, for tonight's topic on being careful is found in Ephesians 5.15. It says, look carefully then how you walk. Live purposefully and worthily and accurately, not as the unwise and witless, but as wise, sensible, intelligent people. Look carefully then how you walk. That's what we're gonna do tonight. We're gonna look carefully at how we're walking. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I think it's alive, it's active. And Lord God, I thank you, your mighty word that goes forth tonight is gonna to awaken with eyes to see how are we living our life. And Lord God, that it would bring clarity into the path that is ahead of us. In Jesus' name, amen. So if being careful in the, you know, dictionary kind of approach, it means basically um, to give watchful attention to, to supervise and be responsible. So when you are looking carefully how you walk, you're being responsible in how you're, you're walking, how you're, you're living your life. Now, it uh, is interesting in that definition, it says to supervise, to have responsibility. So if you're supervising yourself, let's just take a minute. How are you doing in supervising yourself? Are you watching your words? Are you careful as to where you're spending your time? Uh, do you have a plan? Are you really seeking out what God's purpose is? Are you making opportunities? to fulfill it. And there's many more questions we could ask, but bottom line is this, take note, be your own supervisor. God's giving you the helper of the Holy Spirit, but he wants you to live purposefully. Now, tonight, as we look at being careful how you live and how you walk, bottom line is this, it really means to be wise. If you're being careful, you're walking out in wisdom. And I love Proverbs and it talks a lot about wisdom. But bottom line is this, when you're wise, you are making wise decisions. And you are making choices that will bring you to that place that will bring about God's best for your life. Now, um, he has a plan for your life. He has a plan to give you hope in a future. One of our favorite scriptures there, right? But in order to, um, tap into that you've got to know what are the plans that he has for you you got to know he's got plans for you to give you hope in a future but you got to know what they are and he says he's written all the days of your life before you were born so how are you gonna tap into that well number one it's supervising yourself you're creating an atmosphere you're cre creating a place for your decisions to bring about the fruit that he wants to um, just multiply in your life. So uh, as we get started, think about the scripture in Proverbs 2, 8 through 10. So he grants good sense to the godly. He's their shield. He protects them. What's this? He guards their pathway. But what else does he do? It says he will show, God will show how to distinguish right from wrong and how to find the right decision every time. For wisdom and truth will enter the very center of your being, filling your life with joy. So the number one decision in order to fulfill your plan, to be careful how you live, you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life. That's number one, right? Because when you surrender your life to him, he gives you the Holy Spirit, and from there, you have the ability to begin this life that he has. So that's, that's a good decision, and you wouldn't be watching if you hadn't done that or been here right now if you hadn't made a decision to want to go further in that walk that he has for you. 
But when you invest in your life, when you're careful at how you live your life, you're not gambling. You are being intentional. A gambler, what happens? There's a lot of risk. And unfortunately, statistics show you lose everything. But when you're an investor, when you plan appropriately, you'll be able to reap the harvest and the outcome that God wants to achieve in your life. So he has plans to give you hope and a future. That's your outcome. So he wants to take you to that place, but you're not a gambler. You're not gonna just hope that it's gonna happen. You can know because the scripture says, what? He will not only guard your pathway, but he's gonna show you how to distinguish right from wrong. He will help you find that right decision that's for you. Now, all of you should know we're not perfect. God knows it. And so thank God he's given us the Holy Spirit who provides that peace, that inner peace. When you, uh, everything around might say, yes, this is the answer. But then the peace inside will settle it for you. You've heard the story. Pat was uh, going to be assigned to teach at the JAG school for the Air Force. And he had it in his mind. We had talked about it. Maybe we should buy a place. We've moved around so much. Maybe we should start thinking about, you know, getting our feet settled. And it was a great area. The price point was really good. And so he called me. We are currently stationed in Hawaii. And I still remember the phone. This is before cell phones. I remember the phone, the punch book, you know, the, with the little long cord and saying, love, you know what? I just, I can't explain it but I don't have peace. I don't think we should do it. And he's like, but, and he went through this long list again. You know, the price is right, we qualify, we got VA loan, I mean, everything was right. But I'm like, hun, I can't explain it, but I don't have peace. Mm -hmm. And then sure enough, two weeks later, his orders got changed. We weren't going to Alabama. Oh no, they were sending us to Newport, Rhode Island because Pat didn't know that his boss was getting ready to pin on one star, was gonna move to DC, and one of his new responsibility was putting together a team out of Newport, Rhode Island. And when he found out after meeting my mother, and we know how wonderful she is, and she just had a lovely conversation with them, and he realized she's only an hour away from Newport, Rhode Island, he thought, hmm, he has two young children and a wife, but she would be near her mother. And so orders shifted. Pat and I and the kids went to Newport, Rhode Island. We were there before our household goods arrived. We're eating on the stairs. We're doing the, you know, camping and then heading to mom's as much as possible to get a real meal because if anyone knows, I don't really cook real meals, but my mom does. Hi mom, if you're listening, you are the mostest wonderful mom ever. And so uh, he was off in Albania and I didn't see him for the next couple months. This is before he had email, Skype, everything else. So he was gone, the iron curtain fell, he was all over that place. But his boss knew we'd be okay because he met my mom, but God knew I'd be okay. He gave me peace. Can you imagine if we had bought that home? He said, honey, we could, ha we could have all the paperwork in place, non-refundable deposits. Can you imagine? I mean, that's the God we have. He will help us, like the scripture says, to live carefully, to, to then um, see and be careful how we walk. So he will give us the opportunity, like the scripture in Proverbs, to make the right decision at every time. Why? Because he has a plan that gives you hope and a future. Now, he knows in this world, did I really want to move uh, to Newport, Rhode Island? Well, um, I was excited to be near my mom, excited to be near my father. So you, you betcha, I was excited to pick up and go. Was I excited that my husband would be gone the whole time? Not really. But what I love is God knows just what we needed. That three-year assignment ended up only being two. So God knew we had just enough time. So life, you gotta, you gotta spend it carefully. Now God gave me a plan. 
He told me that my, my father didn't have long to live. And he gave me a, a purpose. He said, Cindy, I want you not to do ministry. I don't want you to focus on ministry in the church and beyond. Your ministry is going to be your family. I want you to create memories with your dad, with your grandchildren. Get to know your sister who's only 30 minutes away and her family. And then make these memories. Now, it doesn't seem supernatural. It's not outreach that I love to do, not Bible teaching. But God knows the season. And if you're walking as he's directing, being careful, right? Like it says here, being wise and sensible, you buy up the moments. You take advantage of situations knowing it's just for a season and you give it your whole heart. I'm so glad I had that time. Two years, we packed it in. My parents had a 40th wedding anniversary. We celebrated that at a week long celebration. My dad, he says, you know, this ceremony, of course, I had to have a full program because if anyone knows me, I love planning parties. So we had this huge program. I had um, the grandkids involved. It was a big thing. But bottom line, God says, you may be celebrating their wedding, but you're going to be honoring your father. So everything we did was about honoring my dad. And then we got orders, and then we moved, and then he died. So you know, God, he knows the days that is ahead of us. He will prepare us. Now, did I cry when dad died? You betcha. Did I have remorse? No, no regrets. I knew I celebrated. I couldn't have packed in those two years any more fuller. He turned 61, we did a Chuck E. Cheese party. Why? Because I knew those grandbabies would love it, and he was a good sport about it. He sat in that chair, and he had his little, you know, kid hat, because we did a kid party for our grandpa, and the kids were crawling all over him. Of course, they must have been sugared high, but they had a wonderful time, and the memories, my heart was full. You see, in the midst of sorrow, there's hope. You've got a God that is there, bringing the sunshine when he knows the rain will come. That's why you've got to embrace each moment because in this world, there's trials, there's tribulation, there's loss, there's sorrow. But when he is helping you walk this life, being careful, being wise with each step you tread. Now it's interesting uh, when you look at that um, scripture of carefully, Another translation, and if you really get back down to it, particularly in the King James, which I grew up in that, it says circumspectly. That means you're looking cautiously all around. So when you're carefully walk, walking the life that God has, you're being very mindful, very careful about each step that you're treading. Why? Because there's a result. There's an outcome. With right. each direction, with each decision that you make, a step, it, it's not just a physical step, it's the decisions and the choices that you make. And guess what? There are consequences to it. There's an outcome to it. So if we were to supervise our decisions, are we making wise choices that will leave a legacy to those behind? That's what God wants. In fact, Proverbs talks about the legacy. A wise person leaves a legacy. Now, we know that people are watching us. In fact, the organization I work for, hence just running right in tonight, is uh, about modeling professionalism. Because in uh, the field of law, which is what our organization's about, we find you can't always learn. You can learn some things in school, but you're not gonna learn the value of civility and the importance of professionalism and excellence in your practice. So what we do as an organization, we identify individuals that model these values, and then we write their story or we celebrate, that's one of my jobs, we celebrate by giving them a recognition and award. But you know what, God does that with us. He wants us to model and to be a light to the world. They may not see Jesus, and hey, we know we don't physically see him, but his, the revelation 
that his word brings. We can see and understand, we can taste and see that the Lord is good. And in that, we're able to model that to the world around us. And you know what? They may not understand the God we serve, but they can see it by us living carefully. So let's get into some points. We just talked uh, as an introduction about the importance of walking carefully. But let's, um, let's get into kind of some more depth. Now, notice this, and I want to just highlight this just briefly. One more thing about walking. Notice that we have to walk in it. Interesting? Walking takes effort. It means decisions and it means activity. It's not something that's done like this. It's a process. So when you're living carefully, you're in the process of making those wise choices. Ephesians 2.10 says this, we're God's masterpiece. We're created anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do what? We can do good things that he planned for us long ago. So he has this plan and he won't, if we make that decision to make Jesus the Lord of our life, then what happens, we're able to walk in those good things. So walking, it's a decision, it's process, it's an activity. So point number one, be careful not to be deceived. Be careful not to be deceived. Now, one thing I put in here, and there's a whole lot I could have gone into, but you know, I, being a children's pastor, I noticed even with my own kids, there comes a time that when they reach adulthood and they enter into, as I call the gap years, those years that they're transitioning to be their own, you know, they have to almost re-surrender their life to Christ in a brand new way. Why? Because it's not secondhand faith. We don't, we're not, you know, uh, we are all children of God, not grandchildren right we are children of God so as you grow in Christ as a child you almost have to renew that commitment and I remember it so clearly with each of my kids and all the children that have become my own through church that I've mentored they have to make that their own choice so at the church I'm at Metro Church my husband and I were involved with starting point on uh, on Wednesday nights and it's exciting to see these individuals, and it's interesting, not all, but a number of them said, you know, I was raised in church as a child, but then I walked away when I went off to college. You know, it's interesting, statistics show that of those that have faith, only 25% of them actually make it through college and still have it. They lose sight of that hope, of that promise that they have. So one of the greatest things for those watching, for those in this room, if you know young people, invest in them, equip them, prepare them, because there's gonna be choices later on and they won't have that support base. And so you wanna help them make those choices wisely because statistics show it's not in their favor. We're in a world right now that, you know, <laughs> there's no God in it. And so, Point number one, be careful, be careful not to be deceived. Be careful not to be deceived. Think of this thought. Faith, it does not eliminate difficulty, but it does help us navigate it while trusting God to deliver us at the right time. So faith, the just shall live by faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. So faith, he gives us that measure of faith and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But you know what, it's so important to be in the word because if you're not in the word, your compass can get off. In fact, I love how the word says it's cleansing. So I was telling Tammy as she was helping me clear out the car today, I was wanting to change the product. We offer a resource center here and I wanted to change it really bad. But when we got up in the attic, my daughter, God bless her, when she was here this weekend, she says, Mom, there is stuff here from when you moved into this house 20 years ago. It's in the same spot, in the same box. I'm like, yeah, that is true. She says, one thing nice about the military, we moved every two years or so, we got to purge and cleanse all this stuff out. 
She says, do you even know what's in there? I said, well, it's labeled. I kind of know what's in there. So she took it upon herself. We were up there. Andrew was part of it too. And we went through that section in the attic. And guess what we found? We found stuff that belonged to my son. Yay, it's in a pile for him to take home. We found old toys that I thought someday my grandkids could play with. Boy, you know what? If we'd waited any longer, they would have been too old to play with these toys. There were old little, um, you know, match cars and uh, G.I. Joe's, there was a yeah. wooden train set, you know, all this stuff, games we found up there, a boatload of stuff. And so we were organizing it and a boatload of stuff we did not need. Andrew filled up the van and it's now <coughs> donated at Goodwill. Why? Because we want to keep it moving. You know what? We did not need the five fans that we found up there. You know, we kept two because Crystal wanted them, but the rest, we're going to just pass it on because we didn't know we had the fans up in the attic and bought new ones. And so Andrew, he had been doing uh, breakfast and he says, Mom, don't you have a toaster? I said, I know, where is that toaster? Guess what we found in the attic? The toaster! You know, it's just amazing. But if you're not careful how you live, if you're not wise, you're gonna miss the reward out there. You're gonna just keep on keeping on and forget the treasures along the way. We found a boatload of treasures. We found Robert's baby book, which I thought was a treasure and still is. But you know what? There's a whole lot of other treasures in life, but the wise are the ones that find it. We cleared that place out. I'm excited because guess what? We have more room for Cindy Dennis Ministries and all the storage we have for that. You know, God is good. That's why I told Crystal, this is awesome. I don't have to pile all this lending library. It can just be in one box on the floor. I can just go right on through. We can organize it all by, by category. But if you're not careful, if you're not in the word, that's cleansing, that's fine tuning, you will be deceived. And if you are basing your knowledge on what other people say and not looking and searching and examining it for yourself, there might be something just a little off that you didn't realize. You know, some baggage, some boxes that just might not need and do not belong there. Think about this scripture in 1 Corinthians 2.15. It says, but the spiritual man tries all things. He examines, investigates, inquires, questions, discerns all things yet is himself to be put on trial and judged by no one. He can read the meaning of everything, but no one can properly discern or appraise or get an insight into him. The spiritual man tries all things. He examines, he investigates, he inquires. God wants us to inquire. That's why for those that are here, you get notes. For those that are watching live, you can ask to join the Cindy Dennis Ministries. We have a competent woman workshop and the notes are download, downloadable and printable from there. Why? Because I don't want you to just take what I talk on for 20 minutes or so. I want you to search it, to examine it for yourself, to look up those scriptures, to maybe get a, you know, a thought that, and just spend some time thinking about what God is stirring and awakening in your heart. So point number one, be careful not to be deceived. Point number two, be careful what you hear. Be careful what you hear. Now I put this as, as a point. Now listen to this. We have a responsibility to be careful about what we listen to, right? So just because someone wants to talk doesn't mean we have to listen to it. Come on now. Come on. Just because they want to talk. Why? Because it could be gossip. And I don't know about you. Once that gossip goes out, not to mention who knows when they're going to gossip about you next time, right? Come on. But what happens, that it, it affects your thoughts about that person. So me, I just try to shift the, the conversation. 
if I'm in a lunch room, I just decide I need to get some water then, I just don't want to be there. I don't want to be a part of it. Now, the Bible has a whole lot to talk about gossip <clears throat> and about words um, and about all that's going on there, but um, I, gosh, I, I went into the next point too quickly, but be careful what you hear. And then the next point, which I jumped into already, and that is be careful about listening to gossip. I guess I was so excited, I just jumped right to it. But think about the scripture. A gossip goes around telling secrets. So don't hang around with chatters. Now there's a whole lot more about gossip. It says it will separate the best of friends. Gossip will cause fires, it's like a flame. It just sparks and it brings destruction. So you need to be very careful to what uh, gossip is, is being said around you. And then along with the spark, it can bring strife. And like I said, it can, that division, a lot of times, <laughs> I remember I was uh, before a board at, at one of the churches I belonged to, and everything I uh, was accused of ended up being gossip. It was untruth. But unfortunately, enough people believe the untruth. So you don't want to be a part of it. Plus, honestly, remember our careful planning. We want an outcome that's going to bring good results. And so as a result, do we want to participate in gossip? No, because I want the fruit of not having gossip being said about me. So I choose not to be a part of it. Look at these scriptures about um, the next uh, be careful. Be careful who you associate with. So um, Proverbs 13, 20 says, walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. Listen to these other scriptures. Don't associate with him who talks too freely, which we just mentioned briefly, Proverbs 20, 19. Don't make friendship with one given to anger. Proverbs 22, 24. Don't associate with those given to change because they're unstable and unreliable. Proverbs 24, 21. Are you seeing a pattern here? And it can go on and on where it talks about uh, being around a drunkard, a swindler, a robber. Why? Because we are words shape us. So if you're around someone who's negative all the time, then we are gonna start thinking negative. I have a boss, God bless her, but her mouth is, is trash talk. And I remember uh, I was just having a conversation, well, having a moment, I should say, and that word almost wanted to come out of my mouth. And, and Pat goes, what, what happened? I said, well, I had to bite my tongue. This word wanted to come out. He said, is that from being around your boss? I said, yeah. See, if you're not careful, it will be a part of the record that's playing in your mind. It just, that's just how it is. And so if you want to see a shift in your life, then surround yourself with people who are positive. If you want to shift to see you making wise decision, well, be around those that are making wise decisions. So um, we would be wise not to choose to be around individuals that are in darkness. Now, it's okay, there are times, we certainly we gotta reach out to them, right? We're a light mm -hmm. to them. But we're talking close associations, yeah. where you're just spending all your time getting advice, asking for support and encouragement. Because why? Because the words that will come out will not be solid words of wisdom. It will be one of feelings, reflection, history, example. But just as I said with the story about the house, Sometimes it may make sense up here, but right here, there's no peace. You gotta go where the peace is. So being careful requires that we put some thoughts into what the outcome of our actions will be, and then make choices that will produce what we desire. You wanna be wise? Then start surrounding yourself with wise people. Now I used to play racquetball. I loved competition, I still do. And so I was in this tournament and how to improve uh, my game in practice, I would always play with someone who was better than I was. And it was interesting, they didn't instruct me, 
I just watched how they play. Well, in life, and we see in the epistles, it says over and over again, watch my example, follow my example. So if you are surrounding yourself with people that are living the life that you know God is drawing yourself to, to be a part of, then follow them, be their example, so make time. Say, hey, can we get together for coffee? They'll learn something and you will too. Be careful how you behave. So live a life that is worthy of the calling that he has graciously extended to you, Ephesians 4.1. Be careful how you behave. So there is um, choices, there's outcome to everything that we do. And I'm gonna wrap up with this in Galatians 6, 9, and 10. May we never tire of doing what is right and good before our Lord. Because in his season, we'll reap that great harvest. That's that outcome. If we can just persist. So seize any opportunity that the Lord gives you to do good things. Be a blessing to everyone, especially within the faithful family. James 3.13. Who in your community is understanding and wise? Let his example, which is marked by wisdom and gentleness, blaze the trail for others. Blazing the trail, that's what God wants us to do and to be. When you're walking carefully, you're an inspiration to other people. You don't have to say, hey, follow me. I'm your inspiration. <laughs> you know what? When you are an inspiration, they will follow. Yeah. I had these munchkins, all five grandkids this weekend. And it was a trip. And Pat goes, how do you do it? You say sit down, <coughs> no fight. We had no fighting, no arguments. I said, hey, this is a free zone here. None will happen in the way of no selfishness. That's mine. That will not be heard. You know what? We never heard it. Why? Because when you establish the boundaries, you establish it, God is, you're, you're creating an atmosphere for God to move. So we did our first sleepover. I mean, they've had lots of sleepovers, but my son's kids usually are in one room and my daughter's kids are in another. But this time we mixed the two older girls together. So I knew it was training, right? So they had their little play time, giggles. I could hear them up there. But I says, okay guys, I give you until nine o'clock and then it's bedtime. So nine o'clock it was, and guess what? I sat right there to ensure that you are going to bed. There was no peeps. I look, I had my eyes closed, cause you know, you have to show by example. I'm sitting there and you know what happened? I actually did fall asleep. <laughs> but when I, you know, right before I did, I had my eye looking and they were looking. I was looking, I was like, shh, they're going shh. But there was quiet, and pretty soon we were all quietly <laughs> sleeping. I eventually got up because of a little awkward sleeping while sitting. But hey, we achieved our goal. They got to bed. They know the value of play, but then there's the time to rest. So our lesson summary. Being careful means being wise. So if you're careful with how you walk, you're making wise choices. Also, Point number two, God has graciously planned a good life for you to live. Point number three, when you apply God's word to your life, you'll find it works exactly as he says it will. So he watches over his word to perform it. Next point, faith doesn't eliminate difficulty. Remember, we're more than conquerors, but it does help us to navigate while trusting God to deliver us at the right time. Next point, you're important to the plan of God, and you do have a purpose. And finally, when you choose God's will, the Holy Spirit will energize you to live out that decision. I know that's a lot of stuff for tonight, but I do hope that the bottom line, we're mindful with how we're living our life, that we're careful with how we're living, that you're thinking about what's the outcome you want to achieve. I have a declaration I wrote, I just felt like Let's seal the deal, right? You know, with the grandkids, I said this is kind of a no selfish zone. Well, tonight, let's create a zone that we are gonna be careful. We're gonna live wise. We're gonna be
be successful in that life that God has. So for those that are in the room and has the handout on the bottom of page seven, it says declaration. Let's all say it out loud. And for those watching, if you have the notes, join us as well. I commit to live a Jesus-centered life before others. I am disciplined to focus on the priorities of my life. I have God's wisdom and power helping me as I make decisions. I will be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and quick to obey his leading. God's presence and peace adorn my life like a beautiful robe. God's grace and favor are crowns on my head. His goodness and mercy follow me all the days of my life. I tell you, just saying that, I just feel power being abused. Let's use our words. Let's be careful how we walk. And that means lining our words and our thoughts as one in accordance with God's plan. Well, it was fun. I had a good time. If you were here, you could stay on for some discussion time, but oh well, I gotta say goodbye to our Facebook friends. Thank you so much for joining us. Let me pray a blessing upon you. Heavenly Father, I pray that your word that went forth tonight, that is powerful, that is alive and active. Lord God, I thank you. It fell on good ground and it's bringing forth a harvest, a harvest of blessing, a harvest that we will be mindful of our actions, our deeds, our words. Lord God, we'll be able to, as a supervisor, align our life with your plan and your purpose. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks again, everyone. Bye-bye.